Welcome to today's Bible teaching with Pastor Mike Bernard of Shoreline Community Church in North Bend, Oregon. We hope you will be blessed as we explore the riches of God's Word verse by verse. Please open your Bible and join us for today's message. Here's Pastor Mike. Father, thank you once again that we can gather here today. And as we look at this vital topic on spiritual gifts, I pray that you would speak to each and every one of our hearts, Lord, that we could find our part in the body of Christ, that which you've designed for us to do. And we praise you, Lord. We love you so very much. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you open up in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 31, we're kind of in a middle, in a mini-series in the, this, this book of 1 Corinthians in which we're dealing with a section right now that has to do with spiritual gifts. And as we go through this particular part, what we found out, in fact, we found this out last week, and I've been sharing this with you, at the moment of regeneration, at the moment you come to faith in Jesus Christ, from that moment on, you are given at least one spiritual gift by God. The majority of us have been given more than one spiritual gift. Those gifts are to be used for the building up of the body of Christ to the fullness of Christian maturity. And so in explaining this, what the Apostle Paul does is he takes the human body. And through that body, he demonstrates that there is both unity and diversity. You've got one physical body. You've got many parts of that body. Each part has a specific function for us to be all that God wants us to be. And the same is true when it comes to the spiritual gifts that God has, has called each of us into one body, the church. And as we use these spiritual gifts, the church can become all that God wants it to be. I think it's interesting in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 14, in this brief section of Scripture, that the word body is used here 18 times from, chapter tw or from verse 12 to verse 27. So let's go ahead and we'll pick it up in verse 12 and work through, and hopefully you'll be able to see some areas of how the spiritual gifts apply to your life. And maybe some of you here today are even wondering, what are those gifts? I'm not sure where my part is in the body of Christ. And I hope it's an encouragement to you as we go through as well. Beginning with verse 12, Paul writes this. He said, for as the body is one and has many members. Remember that illustration of the physical body. As the body is one and has many members, but all of the members of that body being many are one body. So it is with Christ. I like the way that the NIV translates this. It says, the body is a unit. And though it is made up of many parts, and though all of its parts are many, they form one body. And so it is with Christ. You see, the healthy human body requires to have many different parts that are working in the same direction. And it's the same with the spiritual gifts as well. If we're going to have a healthy church, what we need is we need the body of Christ using those gifts that God has given you for the building up of the body to the fullness of that Christian maturity. In verse 13, we learn something pretty precious. It says this, For, if, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been given to drink into that one spirit. So we were all baptized. There's different kinds of baptism that we see in the Bible. We see uh, proselyte baptism in the Old Testament. We see the baptism of Jesus. We see John's baptism, a baptism of repentance. We see the baptism of the Spirit. We see water baptism. And here what we're looking at in verse 12 is the body is a unit, and though it's made up of many parts, though all of its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. So we were all baptized into that one body, whether we're Jews or Greeks. There's a difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Spirit. 
In fact, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that one-time event that occurs at the moment of regeneration. You all were baptized, past tense, to the believers. That baptism occurs at the moment of regeneration, at the moment of being born again. You are brought and you are included into the body of Christ. That's one kind of a baptism. People have often asked, how about filling of the baptism, uh, filling, excuse me, filling of the Holy Spirit? What does that mean? Well, the filling of the Spirit is something that we should seek throughout our entire lives. So the moment you believe, you are incorporated into the body of Christ. But throughout our entire life, we are to seek the filling of the Holy Spirit. And when does that happen? That happens when we're close to God. Have you ever had a time in your life where you've kind of drifted away from God in your walk with him and you feel so distant from him? You just don't feel like you're having that connection. But there's other times as well in which you feel like, man, I am so close to God right now. I never want this time to end. And yet it always seems to end. Well, once we're born again, we're to seek the filling of the Holy Spirit as we're in tune with God. The Spirit begins to work within us. One of the things that I ask when I come in here in the morning is that the Holy Spirit would lead me to people that need prayer, people that need a word of encouragement. And I'll, I'll be drifting around and I'll be praying with those individuals in order to try to encourage them and to help them. Well, each of us should seek that filling. Warren Wordsby says to be baptized by the Spirit means that we belong to the body of Christ. To be filled with the Spirit means that our bodies belong to Christ. The filling of the Spirit has to do with the Spirit's control in our life. And yet there's another kind of baptism as well, isn't there? In fact, as, as soon as believers, as soon as people come to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we should follow him in water baptism. It shouldn't, for the person who decides not to be baptized until the very end of their life or not to be baptized at all, that should be the exception and not the rule. We see that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, is different from that of water baptism. The baptism of the Holy Spirit happens the moment you're born again. Water baptism happens afterwards. Nearly 43 years ago, we're working on that anyways, my wife and I exchanged our wedding vows as we're at church and, and we're, we're exchanging those, those vows, did our love begin right then or did our love begin before that? Our love was before that. And when we went to fulfill our vows in, in, in our marriage, we were, we were sealing those vows. And finally, after those vows were exchanged, something was taken to seal the vows that, that were given. And we exchanged rings one upon another. And now when anyone looks at this ring, what that says is from this moment on, my love and my life belong to my wife. And that's how baptism is. You see, in water baptism, we already love Jesus when we go to be baptized. Jesus told us that we are to be baptized. He commanded it. The apostles commanded it. It's the right thing to do for a good conscience that we be baptized. But when we're baptized, this, this little procedure that we go through, this little ceremony, is publicly declaring like we did at our wedding. From this time forth, my love and my life belong to you. And so we see that there's a difference here. You see, the baptism of the Holy Spirit places the believer into the body of Christ. The baptism by water identifies us with Jesus, with his death, with his burial underneath the water, lift back up with his resurrection. From this time forth, I long to live for you. And we see in verse 13, Paul goes on, he says, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. The incredible thing about the body of Christ is there should be no distinctions in regards to racial distinctions. There should be no cultural distinctions. There should be no social distinctions. Wherever we go in the entire world, we are one in Christ. We are part of the body of Christ. I've written to friends of mine, I said, look, there's only one color that matters out there, and that color that matters out there is red, that everyone in the body of Christ is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, amen? And we are one in Christ. I remember 
Some time back, we had a, a lieutenant in the Coast Guard that uh, came to church all the time. And in fact, he helped me start the Coast Guard Bible study many years ago. And uh, his name was Jeremy Anderson. He was a lieutenant at that point. And I'm sitting there, I'm talking to him in the sanctuary. And uh, a young non-rate comes walking in right out of boot camp and comes up and says, come on, I, I want to introduce you to somebody. Hey, Jeremy, Jeremy here's so-and-so. They just got here from boot camp. I said, Jeremy is a lieutenant. Sir! <laughs> And Jeremy goes, now wait a minute, wait a minute. He, goes, he says, when we are in church, we are the body of Christ. Is Jeremy here. You know, and that's the way it should be, isn't it? Because you don't have those social distinctions or rank distinctions within the body of Christ. We are one here. By the way, today Jeremy's a commander in the Coast Guard, and I'm sure he has the very same attitude. You see, the ground is level at the foot of, of the cross, each and every one of us are sinners who were saved by grace in Christ. And Christ is the head of the church. Verse 13 goes on. Paul writes, and, and have all been made to drink the one spirit. In other words, every regenerate, every born again Christian is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, not an impersonal force. He is a he. And when we wrote our, our Shoreline Community Church Statement of Faith, this is what we had to say about the Holy Spirit. We believe the Holy Spirit is one in essence with the Father and the Son, yet different in role. We believe the Holy Spirit was sent by the Father and the Son to convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. He is called the Spirit of Christ and also the Spirit of Truth. The Holy Spirit has been active in creation and revelation and empowerment and inward renewal. The Spirit regenerates. That means gives new birth. He baptizes. He enlightens. He teaches. He sanctifies. He seals. He counsels. And he transforms the lives of believers into Christ-likeness. The work of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Jesus by showing his disciples who he is. We believe the Holy Spirit empowers each believer for ministry and is the giver of spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit is the comforter who helps us in our weaknesses by interceding for us when we are too weak and too discouraged to pray. Verse 13 says, And have all been made to drink into one spirit. We are all baptized at the moment of faith. We receive all of those things within our life as the Holy Spirit begins to indwell and minister to us. Verse 14, for in fact the body, meaning the human body, uh, is not one member, but it's many. You see, in the church, we can't be a lone ranger ministry. We need to be out there using all of the gifts with everybody working together because that's the way that God designed for the church to run. But in Corinth, apparently the more spectacular gifts, in particular the gift of tongues, were being glorified within that church. And so Paul began to address the issue, and he begins to address it by using the human body to show how vital every part of that body is. In verses 15 and 16, he writes, If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, am I not of the body? Is, is it therefore not of the body? You see, each part of the body affects all the others. I'm a big Golden State Warrior fan, and Seth Curry, excuse me, Steph, Steph Curry uh, is probably the, one of the best basketball players in the world right now, but he's had a problem over the years with ankle sprains. And every now and then, he'll twist that ankle, and it'll put him out for a season of time. He's got these incredible skills to be able to shoot baskets from three-quarters of the way across the court and see people and do passes all over the place. But if that foot slips and that ankle's sprained, it'll put him out. You know, and so often it's the same way for us. I don't know if you've ever injured a leg or, or something, and before you know it, it begins to affect other parts of your body as you begin to compensate. But it's really important that each part of the body is used. And we tend to take the body for granted until one part gets injured and it stops working. Well, how does all of this relate to the church? 
You see, God designed us to be interdependent upon one another. We need each other. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 25, the writer of Hebrews says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaken the assembling together, as is the manner but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So easy to walk away from church, isn't it? You know, you, at first it may seem hard, but you give it a little bit of time, and after a while it gets easier and easier as time goes by. And yet, the writer of Hebrews says, look, he says, do not forsake the assembling together as some are in the manner of doing, but as we come towards the end times, as we get towards the return of Christ, that we're to encourage one another, and all the more as we see the day coming. Now, I don't think anyone's going to be doing any barbecuing today with a cold barbecue outside. But during the summer, we do it quite often, don't we? And I just want you to imagine one of those round barbecues, and you got the charcoals on, and you know, go ahead and you light up the fire, and it gets to the point where those coals are just red hot, and then you're ready to go ahead and do your barbecuing. What would happen if you take some tongs, you go over, you grab one of those red hot coals, and you take it over and you put it on the side of the barbecue. The fire over here is just going and it's going like crazy and it's really hot. What's happening to the coal on the side? It's beginning to go out, isn't it? The fire is beginning to go out. I uh, used to be in retail before I came into ministry and I had to work on Sundays quite often, which was really difficult at first. Uh, at first, I had to work Sundays. I thought, how am I going to miss, how am I going to get by not being able to go to church? I need to go to church. First paycheck comes in, you got time and two-thirds. That's pretty good, but I sure miss my church. The next week, you go ahead, and uh, it's, it's still hard. It was not quite as hard. And the week after that, you're starting to get used to that bigger check. And it's getting a little easier every single time. And I think if you examine your own life, what you'll see is when you're together with the body of Christ, those are the times that you're growing. But when you separate from that body and you're over here by yourself, the fire begins to go out in your life. And what's the cure to that? The fire is still going here. You need to get back in the fire. You need to get back to that point in which you're in the body of Christ and you are growing. You know, it's, it's the same for us spiritually as it is for that piece of charcoal. We've got to be in the body of Christ in order for us to grow. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? Can you imagine if, if the whole body were a tongue? Do you remember back years ago, those of you that are old enough, the Rolling Stones came out with an album. I can't remember the name of that album, but it had a big tongue on the front of that album. You remember that thing? It was gross. Absolutely gross. Now, can you imagine if all that was in the body of Christ was a big tongue? And maybe there's a point here that goes along with what Paul's saying, because in Corinth, they'd put so much stress on that gift of tongues that every part of the body has a need Fortunately, God gave us different gifts. We, we need each other. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22. Solomon writes this. He says, Without counsel, plans go awry. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. We need each other. This building that you're sitting in, uh, when we moved into this building several years ago, uh, I came and I looked at it, and it didn't look anything like this. It was a, it was a box. This was a box back here. Uh, it was really lacking tender, loving care. Uh, it was a mess. It was an absolute mess. I looked around, and I saw the borders all the way, way around houses here, the power station here, the road here with a big hedge and private property, and, and houses across the street. And I looked at this, and I, I thought, it is so small. This church will never, this would never do for a church. And all the other elders on the board, and we're an elder-run church, we had six of us, and we're all going back and forth, and all five of you are saying, this is great, this will work. They could see what it could become. I saw a box. And so I said, okay, I'm going to trust you guys and we're going to move forward. And God did incredible things. Within five years after we moved into this building, the building was paid off, praise God. 
And then just a couple of years later, in fact, a couple of, a couple of months later, I should say, all of a sudden we find out that the property over here to the side is in foreclosure and all of those land limitations were gone. We made a bid, we, we got it, and now we've got all kinds of acreage. And it's so cool that God worked through the counsel of the multitude of many and where I didn't see it, in my giftedness, the rest of the men did. And as we move forward, God has done incredible things. And that's how the body of Christ works, that together we work, together we, we get with the, the counsel of the multitude here. Verse 18, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. It's important for us to realize that God is sovereign in the distribution of gifts, and he gives them to us as he sees that we can be used the best for his glory. Verse 19, and if they were all one member, where would the body be? I want you to think back to what we read just a moment ago about the human eye. The human eye is an incredible part of the human body. In fact, what that eye can do is amazing. But if you remove that eye from the body and you set it by itself, it can't do anything. And even if it could see, it couldn't communicate to the brain. It couldn't communicate if there's a fire to the, to the rest of the body and to the legs to get out. If it's a life, life-threatening situation, it couldn't communicate to the arms. All the parts of the body need to be working together in the way that God designed it for me. And so it is with the spiritual gifts. God designed us as Christians to be interdependent upon one another. We need each other. Verses 20 through 21. But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you. Nor can the head say to the feet, I have no need for you. You see, a team effort is always more effective than the person who tries to do everything on his own. I, I love our Coast Guard, and I, I just want to set an example here. You see a, an H-65 helicopter in the background. Imagine for a moment that an emergency call came in. When that helicopter goes out, you've got a pilot, you've got a co-pilot, you've got a flight mech, and you've got a rescue swimmer. That flight mech is on that, that flight in case something mechanical goes wrong while they're out there over the ocean or wherever they're at, that that person can jump in and, 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 and maybe fix that along with many other things that might come up. The swimmer is there to go down into the water to be able to rescue. If any members of that crew are missing, the entire mission is at jeopardy. But even if the mission goes fine, you not only have that, you've got the calm room in the back which is receiving the emergency calls in which they're working with each other. And then beyond that, you've got the command which is giving the orders of what they can do and what they can't do. But even beyond that, you go back and, and you're back in the hangar with all the flight mechs who are doing all of the intricate work on those helicopters. It's a team effort to be able to get out there and win and to accomplish the mission. And it's a team effort for us as Christians today to be able to work together to accomplish that mission of reaching people for Christ. Even Billy Graham, we, we think of him as an individual, but he had a team with him at all times. Cliff Barrows, George Beverly Shea, you had others that were there, local pastors that would come along that would do the recruiting for the people who would come into the Crusades. When ministry happens, it's a, a group effort, a team effort, and the team is always better than the individual. Verse 22, no much more, Paul says. He says, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. You see, no Christian is spiritually self-sufficient. We need each other. We need the parts of the body of Christ working. Verses 23 and 24, and those members of the body which we think are less honorable. On those we bestow greater honor. And on our unpresentable parts, we have greater modesty. Maybe we come up with clothes to cover those parts. But our presentable parts have no need. We tend to place higher value on the parts of the body that are visible, don't we? In fact, if you look at, at TV or movies today, they're always showing off the pieces of the outward body, but is it the outward body that is really most important to us physically and for survival? In reality, some of the most important parts of the body are quietly working behind the scene. How often, you know, somebody might be able to say, oh, look at those legs, or look at the muscles on that muscle man, or whatever it might be. How often have you heard somebody walk up and say, oh man, 
what a gorgeous looking liver you have, huh? <laughs> or how, how, how about that pancreas, huh? Or whatever it might be there. But which parts are really absolutely essential for the survival of the body? Can you survive without an arm? Can you survive without a leg? Can you survive without your pancreas or your liver or your heart or your brain? And sometimes it's those parts of the body that you don't see that are really important in keeping things together. I've often said, you know, we get more complaints on a Sunday morning if the coffee isn't made than if the pastor doesn't show up. <laughs> so it's little things within the body of Christ, right, that, that really make a, a difference. Verse 24b, but God composed the body, giving greater honor to that which lacks it. I love studying history. One of my favorite heroes of the faith is Dwight Moody. Lived from 1837 to 1899 with most of his ministry going on in the Chicago area. But following the great Chicago fire, he made a trip over to the United Kingdom in 1872. And it was to be a study trip. It was for him to just calm down after that fire and so many of his people being killed, the city being just flattened by the fire and get refocused on God. And he went and he spent time with Charles Spurgeon and he was just planning on studying. And he went to Ireland near Dublin and one night after an all-night prayer meeting, he was out with an individual by the name of Henry, you ready for this, Butcher Varley and some other men, and at the end of that prayer meeting, early in the morning, they went out for a walk. One of the things that Varley said to him stuck in his mind for days, and he said, Moody, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man who is fully devoted to him. And for days, Moody chewed on that, and then he ended up leaving, and he ended up going back to England. And that's where we pick up the picture here in Moody's bi uh, biography, John Pollock. And he says this, back in London, in the gallery of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, Varley's remarks and Spurgeon's preaching focused Moody's attention on something I had never realized before. It was not Spurgeon who was doing that work. It was God. And if God could use Spurgeon, why could he not use me? It was then that the visit to Britain really began to get out of hand. A congregational minister persuaded Moody to preach at the Arundel Square near the Pentonville prison in a lower class district. And Sunday morning smug, stolid drowsiness made him rue and irresolutionable in accepting. Unknown to him, a woman hurried back to her younger sister, a mere slip of a woman, but permanently bedridden, named Marianne Adlard. And he broke, she broke the news that Mr. Moody of America had preached. Marianne exclaimed, she said, I know what that means. God has heard my prayers. She drew from under her pillow a crinkled, faded newspaper cutting. Together they looked again at the account of the unknown American's activity in the slums of Chicago, which had caused Marion days after days, day after day, to pray, O oh Lord, send this man to our church. That evening, from the moment that Moody mounted the pulpit, the congregation listened, hushed and alert. His every word seemed with electricity. At the close, he asked anyone who wanted to have their lives changed by the power of God through faith in Jesus Christ as personal Savior and wanted to become Christians to rise that he might pray for them. And people began to arise all over that chapel. Surprised by the reaction, Moody thought that even he or they had, either he or they had made a mistake and told him to sit down, sit back down. And he repeated what he meant by becoming a Christian and asked that those who wish should, should withdraw to the adjoining hall or the schoolroom. He watched astonished as scores of men, women, and older children made their way quietly to the connecting door. The schoolroom had been prepared as an inquiry room with just a dozen seats or more in there, and many more had to be sent for. This woman, Marianne Laddard, who was permanently disabled, 
permanently bedridden, would be seen by many to be worthless, unproductive for society. What did she do? She prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed, and God answered that prayer. You know, no matter what your role is in the church, no matter how small you think that role may be, God has a role for you. And when people work together, great things happen. And in this particular case, Moody ended up coming to her church. Moody ended up praying at her church. And Moody ended up see, preaching to the point where many, many people came to Christ. Well, there's many gifts working behind the scenes in the body of Christ, the church. We got those who pray. We got those who give. We got those who serve. We got those who minister in ways that you don't even see, maybe to your neighbors. 27 years ago, I had a friend that... I had to paint my house back in Hayward, and it was under the eaves, and it was really difficult. And he was a professional painter. And I asked Bob, I said, Bob, can I hire you to come over here and just paint under the eaves for me, and I'll do the, do the, the, the rest of the, the, the house. And so Bob comes over, and he's doing it, and we said, we'll, we'll give you a steak dinner, you know, for doing this. And he says, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And he's over there, and he gets done. He looks at me, and he says, where's the rest of the paint? And I said, well, I said That's, we can't afford to pay you, Bob. He said, I didn't ask you for money. Where's the rest of the paint? And he took the paint and he painted our entire house for the price of a steak dinner. You know, there's little things that happen in the body of Christ you don't hear a whole lot about. And he had another situation in which he did that accidentally. Went to the wrong house, painted the whole house, and found out that the man, <laughs> the man had cancer and couldn't afford to pay, paint his house. And he had been praying for someone to do it. Isn't that incredible? It's incredible when you see God working behind the scenes. Well, every believer has a critical role to play in the body of Christ. And my question to you is, have you found your role? Verses 25 through 26 go on and says that there should be no schism, there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, then all of the members suffer. I want you to think back to the last time you had a fever. Oh, all of a sudden you don't feel good. You're getting some chills. Your body is beginning to ache. And finally, you end up in bed so that the rest of the body can go ahead and, and begin to, to help your body end up healing. You see, when a person develops a fever, that fever affects the entire body. And we transfer this concept to the body of Christ, the church. When one person in the body is hurting, the rest of the parts in the body should realize the pain and they should come to the assistance. You see, so often we see the church as being an army on the offensive, but in reality, we're not only an army on, on, on the offensive. Whenever you've got an army that's on an offensive, you also need a hospital to be there. And the church is both an army in a hospital. And when we see our brothers and sisters who are hurting as part of the body of Christ, we need to come to their aid. Verse 26b says, Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. In other words, if one member of the church or one member, one church in the community is honored for one thing or another, we all ought to be happy about that. I don't know how we ever got to this point, but I think there's way too much competition that's going on in churches. And when we see God blessing in different areas, we ought to be thrilled by the blessings that are happening within those areas. That's one of the things that so excites me about Pray Oregon Coast. This Friday night, we're going to have churches from all over this community here gathering. And, and since we started this a couple of years ago, it's gone on month after month, and we go from church to church to church in the community. And, and we've probably got eight to ten pastors of other churches in this community that are going to be here praying on Friday night. And it's so neat to see the body of Christ come together as one. Now, you are the body of Christ, members individually. In other words, collectively as born-again believers, we are part of the universal church. One of the things we don't do too often today is say the Apostle Creed. And I'd like to ask that we read this together if we could. It's one of the great creeds of the faith, probably the only creed that uh, is almost universally accepted by the church. Can we read it together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Every time I do this, somebody gets upset and they say, what are you, what are you doing saying the holy Catholic Church? Do you know what Catholic means? It means universal. And do you know that the holy Catholic Church is different from the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is a denomination. The Holy Catholic Church is made up of all true believers of all time. There's a difference between the visible church and the invisible church. What's the difference? Get in your car, you start driving away. When you go from church or from church here today, you're going to be driving through the streets and you're going to see a church down at the corner. You're going to see churches in other areas as you're driving on home. Those are the visible churches. And when you've got a visible church, it's a building with a group of people that are, are meeting together. But it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody within that building is a Christian. What's the difference with the invisible church? It's called invisible because only God knows. Only God can see who belongs in that church. It's made up of all true believers of all time. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Verse 28, and God has appointed these in the church first apostles. Notice the order here. You've got that primary sense in which there's 12 original apostles. Later on, you've got Matthias. Later on, you've got Paul that adds to that group. In a lesser sense, there's other apostles, maybe little a if you would. Barnabas, Silas, Timothy, others that are named in the New Testament. Today, we see this office maybe being, in a minimal way, operated by missionaries who go overseas into different areas and they present churches. But in the primary sense, you're talking about the original 12, you're talking about Matthias, you're talking about Paul. Second in order, we see we've got the prophets. We see this gift of prophecy being used in the Bible in two different senses. We talked about it last week, you remember? The first sense is foreknowledge. In other words, the prophet will tell you what's about ready to happen. But the second sense in which the biblical prophet speaks is in forth telling. What does it mean to forth tell? To, you can foretell and you can forth tell. What does it mean to forth tell? It means you take the word of God and you present that in power to the people in which an incredible impact is made upon the hearts and the lives of people. You see, the two offices here have special roles in laying down the foundation of the church. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 20. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. You see, the first two offices that are mentioned are that of the apostle, one who is sent by Christ, and that of the prophets. In this sense, before the completion of the New Testament, you had people who were bringing forth the, the word here. And what is their role? Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. The apostles and prophets were mentioned first because their role was to lay the foundation for the church that you and I are building on today. Third, we have teachers. By the way, teachers is the only one of the gifts here that's mentioned in all four of the chapters in the New Testament on spiritual gifts. And these teachers are needed to help establish believers in the faith. Uh, I've heard it said this way, that a good teacher takes the cookies from the top shelf and brings them down so that everybody can feast. So, so often, you know, we can, we can talk above everybody. We don't want to do that. You want to get those difficult teachings of the word and theology and all, all these other things and bring them down so that everybody can feast on them and learn from them and enjoy them. Well, after that, we find miracles. Miracles are supernatural acts which are contrary to, to nature. And what's the purpose of a miracle? A miracle is to affirm both the message and the messenger 
And then we've got the gift of healing, those who are able to pray for people and, and see them supernaturally healed. We've got the gift of helps. This has been called service or ministry, and it's the desire to help other people behind the scenes. We've got one deacon in here. I'm not going to say his name. I'll give his initial B. He is working behind the scenes all over the place. I'm always hearing he's at other people's houses doing yard work, doing this, doing that. The person with the gift of, of, of service or ministry doesn't have to be up front. They get blessed just by helping people behind the scenes. Like my friend who came over to my house and ended up painting my entire house when I couldn't afford to have anyone come over and do the whole thing and help me. That was his way of, of being a blessing in the name of Jesus. Well, notice it, 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 we, we see that um, uh, administrations is the next gift that ends up coming back. This is the gift of leadership, the ability to organize, the ability to direct a church. It comes from the meaning of the Greek word to pilot a ship. In other words, to, to steer a large ship. A large Nimitz-class aircraft carrier holds over 6,000 people and tons of military equipment. It's a virtual city on water, but it's directed by one captain. And the people in the church who have that gift of administration can do more than typing. Those people have the gift of being able to take a big ship, the ship of the church, and be able to coordinate people and, and help steer that church in a different direction. Variety of tongues comes up. This is the ability of others to, to speak other languages, either human or heavenly, without ever having been trained in them. I want you to imagine for a moment, can you imagine going over to China, you've never been to China, and you get over there and you want to share the gospel with people, you're not sure how you're going to be able to do that, and when you get there, all of a sudden, the gift of tongues comes upon you and you speak perfect Chinese to the people sharing the gospel. Or you go over to Russia and all of a sudden, boom, there's, there's the, the, the gift of tongues in which you're speaking this other language out here that you've never had any experience in learning. And all of a sudden, God gives you that language so that you can share the gospel of Christ with other people. Do you think that it would be an attention grabber? I somehow think it would. But the question arises, is there such a thing as a heavenly tongue? And I say, maybe. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, it says this, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And so in this particular verse, as Paul, he, he says, look, if I speak the tongues or languages of men and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm just making noise out there. Those who are cessationists would say, well, Paul's just speaking hypothetically here. But I don't know. You know, once again, like I said last week, I've seen so many people who, who do speak in tongues, even though I don't. I've seen so many people that have such an incredible prayer life. It's undeniable. You can't deny the impact that it's made upon them. But it's a spiritual gift, and not everybody has all of the spiritual gifts. But tongues wasn't the greatest of the spiritual gifts, as the Corinthians seem to believe. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3 says this, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhorts to comfort men. This particular verse, if the individual wasn't speaking in tongues, if he wasn't speaking in that other language, then probably somebody, maybe, would be able there to understand what it is that, that he's saying. But no matter what the case is here, what Paul's getting to in the main point here is when that individual speaks tongues, nobody is being edified because nobody understands. But when that person prophesies, when that person speaks the truth, then everybody is being edified and they are being encouraged and it's a comfort to men. And he begins to point to the, the, the priority and the importance of prophecy and using those spiritual gifts that build up the body of Christ. In either case, Paul prioritizes, number one, apostles. Number two, prophecy. When you get to the end of his list, you've got tongues. 
the Corinthians had apparently reversed the order and Paul is working through here. And in fact, to, to get to his point even further, now he begins to ask a series of rhetorical questions in verse 29. He says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Well, what is a rhetorical question? A rhetorical question is a question that's answer is so obvious that it doesn't even deserve a response, not even seeking to have a response. Does every Christian become an apostle? Of course not. And in fact, that's basically what he's saying here. The answer to all of these questions are no. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. Verse 30 goes on, do all have the gifts of healings? The obvious answer is no. Do all speak in tongues? No, of course not. Do all interpret? No. Why is this important? Because there's some people out there saying that you need to have the gift of tongues in order to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And what this scripture teaches us is that nobody has all the gifts. At the moment of regeneration, everybody receives at least one spiritual gift. Nobody receives all of those spiritual gifts. Most of us receive more spiritual gifts. Why is it given that way? Why is it distributed that way? Because God has designed us to be interdependent upon one another. Nobody has all of the gifts. And so for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if tongues is a gift, then it couldn't possibly go to every Christian. And so we need to, to, to see that. Verse 31, Paul goes to the, to the crux of the matter. But earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I will show you a more excellent way. Paul implies that we might be able to have more gifts than we even know. Can you imagine that? Earnestly desire the best gifts. Do you know what your spiritual gifts are? If you don't, I've put some links on the back of the Digging Deeper notes in, in your bulletins to some websites where you can go ahead and take a test, an assessment test, and see what those different spiritual gifts are. But it's possible that as we get involved in different areas of ministry during the course of our life that we'll find a, an area that we are really gifted in that we had no idea that we were gifted in. If you want to know how to find out what your spiritual gifts are, Go out and get involved and try different things and see where God blesses you. William McDonald says the best gifts are those that are the most useful rather than those that are most spectacular. And what are the best gifts? The best gifts are those gifts that build up the body of Christ to the fullness of Christian maturity. Paul uses verse 31 as an introduction to the love chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And he says in verse 31b, he says, and yet I show you a more excellent way. What is the more excellent way? Well, that more excellent way is the way of love. And when it comes to the exercising of our gifts, love's got to be front and center. We've got to do what's best for other people, not what's best for us. We need to use those gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. Have you ever put together a jigsaw puzzle? I know for quite a while my wife and I, we used to get the jigsaw puzzles and we'd be working on them, putting them together. And you get a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and you can spend hours and hours and hours going through that. Have you ever gotten all the way through that thousand piece jigsaw puzzle only to find out that you had a missing piece? When you look at the picture that's on that puzzle, what do you see? In fact, just about all you see is the missing piece, right? The question here in the church and as Christians is, as the body of Christ, what kind of a picture are we trying to present? You know, are we trying to present a picture uh, of, of Jesus Christ in all of his glory? And we have that opportunity as we come together, we work together as a team, we're out there and, and the picture that we're shooting for is, is this, this picture of Christ in his glory. But we go back and, and we see all of a sudden that we've got a missing piece. And we've got another missing piece. I shared with you that we can, we can go without different limbs within our body physically. 
but we can't go without some of the more important things. And when we're healthy, every aspect of our body is working correctly. We're out here, our, our, our hands are working, our fingers are working, our feet are working. But when the leg is cut off, or the arm is taken off, all of a sudden, as you're trying to function, you're, you're not able to function as, as good as you would normally be able to function. God designed you with at least one spiritual gift. Most of you, he gave more than one spiritual gift. Those gifts aren't for your personal pleasure. Those gifts are for the building of his kingdom, for the building up of his body. And when those gifts are missing, it's like that jigsaw puzzle that we're trying to present, that picture we're trying to present at Christ. And all you see is the missing pieces. My question for you is how has God called you to be involved? Well, people say, I, I really don't know. Well, well, try this. I think one of the chief ways of finding out what your spiritual gift is, is to get involved. And you may be thinking right now that, you know, I, 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 I just don't know. Well, try different areas. Or you may have something in your heart that you really enjoy doing. Maybe that's the area of your calling. Maybe that's the giftedness that God has given to you. But get involved and begin to fill in those pieces. And when you find your spiritual gift in this, you will find a joy that you have never experienced before because all of a sudden you are doing what God created you to do. And if you're not doing that, you're going to be frustrated. Or if you're out of that gift in this area, say you're working with children and that's not your gift and you're frustrated and you say, well, I just don't fit with the church here. Well, maybe you do. Maybe it's over here in women's ministries. Maybe it's over here and, and, and just serving behind the scene, going out and helping widows with the yard work at their house. Maybe there's different areas that you can find your place in the body of Christ so that when we go forward in this community, as the, as the community looks at us, that they see Jesus Christ in all of his glory, in all of his majesty, in all of his splendor, with the church as Christ designed it to be. But in order to have a spiritual gift, you need to be saved. You need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to come to the realization that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that we don't measure up for heaven. We're never going to be good enough for heaven. Christ left heaven. He came to this earth. He died on the cross for your sins and my sins so that by grace through faith in him, we can be saved when we trust him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. And as we looked at these gifts today, uh, we see that you have created each and every one of us in a remarkable way with a unique role in the body of Christ. And yet, Lord, maybe there's someone here today who has never received Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. Oh, they've heard about you, but there's no personal relationship there. There's no personal commitment there. And I pray that if that's the case, and if they do want to receive Christ, that they would say a prayer like this, realizing that it's no magical formula, but Lord, it's the state of the heart. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. Lord, I, I have messed up so bad, and I ask you to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Lord, this day I look to you, I put my trust in you, I surrender my life to you. I ask that you would come into my heart and my life, help me to be the kind of man, woman, boy, or girl that you desire for me to be. Lord, this day I receive you. In Jesus' name, amen.